Good afternoon. My name is Ahmed Dalal. I'm the Dean of Georgetown University in Qatar. Uh, first of all, I would like to welcome our guest speakers today, Professor uh, Ravindranath and Professor Ch uh, Chaturvedi, uh, and of course, our colleague, uh, Professor uh, Levin. Uh, in January of this year, Georgetown University's Center for International and Regional Studies, CIRS, launched its Environmental Studies Initiative through an online public lecture and moderated discussion titled The New Political Strategy to Limit Climate Change. This lecture was given by Georgetown University Professor Anatole Levin, who in his recently published book on climate change and the nation state, stresses the need for political leaders to galvanize both public and political will to address the climate change crisis. Sears Center for International and Regional Studies has previously carried out several research projects that address important questions related to the environment, natural resources, and food and, and water uh, insecurity in the Middle East. Through its Environmental Studies Initiative, the center is deepening and expanding on its past work to devote particular attention to human-induced human climate change in trans-regional contexts. Sears has been organizing meetings and workshops on various topics under this thematic area with the goal of stimulating new conversations and scholarship on this important subject. These activities are guided by uh, GEQ faculty members with core expertise on the environment, who along with the, with the global network of scholars are identifying pri priority areas for further research and engagement. Most recently, the center launched, launched a newly formed research initiative on energy humanities, which is being led by other, three other Georgetown University Qatar faculty members, Professor Gogoshian, Kale, and, and Uru. The Energy Humanities Initiative aims to provide new understandings of the influence and impacts of energy in everyday lives. Building on these effort, efforts, I am delighted to welcome you to today's panel, uh, where we will hear from two experts with extensive expertise on the impact of climate change on South Asia. Our speakers, Dr. Ravindranath and Dr. Chaturvedi, will be engaging in a discussion on the impact of climate change on agriculture in South Asia that will be moderated by Georgetown University Professor Anatole Levin. Uh, before I uh, uh, give the, the forum to Professor Levin to properly introduce our guests, I just want to say that uh, there is a live transcript uh, function. If you look at the bottom of the screen at the right, there is a CC live transcript function. You can turn it on and off if, uh, if uh, as you're interested. You can also, uh, in the question and answer period, you can also type your questions and uh, Professor Levin will moderate the questions and address them to the speakers. Welcome again, and I look forward to listening to our colleagues. Professor Levin. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Uh, yes, as uh, Dr. Dalal said, my name is Anatole Levin. I'm a professor here at Georgetown in Qatar, author of a recent book on climate change. I'm also a senior fellow at Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft in Washington, DC. Uh, and I'm delighted to be moderating this panel on climate change and agriculture in South Asia. Um, this is something uh, to which I've paid considerable attention myself. Uh, India is both uh, one of the most important emitters of carbon gases uh, and the fastest growing. Uh, and uh, India and South Asia in general are among the areas of the world most vulnerable to the effects of climate change uh, because of a mixture of already high temperatures, uh, existing water shortages, uh, and of course, high population. Uh, so to discuss this most important of issues, we have two highly distinguished speakers. Professor N. H. Ravindranath of the Center for Sustainable Technologies at the Indian Institute of Sciences in Bangalore. Dr. Ravindranath is a leading expert uh, on the vulnerability of Indian ag agriculture to climate change, uh, on mitigation strategies, land use, and on forestry and deforestation. He has written four books on climate change, as well as books on renewable energy, community forestry, and biomass energy. Uh, he has advised uh, leading Indian and in, uh, international institutions, including the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank, uh, and he has played a very important role in spreading awareness of the threat of climate change in India and beyond. 
Dr. Vibhav Chaturvedi is a leading economist at India's Council on Energy, Environment and Water, CEEW, uh, and he leads their work on low carbon pathways. His research focuses on energy and climate change mitigation issues, including nuclear energy and the nexus between climate policy, energy and water. Uh, he has written numerous essays on this subject uh, and has served on several Indian government committees on energy and climate policy. Uh, so first, I, I will direct a few questions uh, to our, our two participants, and then I will throw the floor open to uh, questions from everybody. Uh, I'll address questions in the first instance to, to one participant or the other, but of course both participants can answer any question. Uh, so my first question uh, is to Dr. Ravindranath. What, in your view, are the main threats posed by climate change to Indian and South Asian agriculture? Uh, do you share fears expressed by various uh, research institutions uh, about the possibility of a radical decline in agricultural productivity as a result of climate change? Uh, and uh, can you suggest what you think should be the main Indian government responses to these dangers? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Levin, and uh, I'm glad to be part of this uh, work, discussion meeting. And, you know, South Asia, as you know, has 1.5 billion people, almost, you know, a quarter of the world's population. And uh, it's a developing uh, region of the world. And uh, they depend on, you know, bulk of the population and all the whole of South Asia depend on agriculture for livelihoods. Though the contribution to GDP is much less, but the population depending on agriculture is still quite a large but you know there are two major impacts of climate change firstly some regions may not be suitable for the crops that are grown there right now whether it's whether it's wheat rice or whatever maize or it could be coffee tea or you know uh, apple or any other crops plantation crops so firstly some other regions where certain crops are grown may not be suitable in the coming decades that means if someone is used to growing wheat and eating wheat every day he may be forced to shift to something else and same with rice so secondly the impact on yield production you know for crop productivity food production thirdly i would say food security and nutrition security you know food security is a is a challenge in south asia with uh, you know fluctuating climate fluctuating rainfall fluctuating food production food security is also under threat you know there are many studies uh, but still i would say the studies in South Asia itself on the impact of climate change on agriculture is still in infancy. There are very few modeling studies and uh, very few experimental studies to assess the impact. But all the literature available reviewed by IPCC and many other agencies show that by 2050s, food production could decline by 30%. In fact, a recent uh, paper published in PNAS, Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences said it tried to assess what will be the impact of every one degree rise in temperature? Based on number of studies and modeling, it concluded that, for example, you know, maize yield would decline by 5% for every one degree warming. Wheat yield would decline by 9% for every one degree warming. You know, rice yield would decline by 6-7% for every one degree warming. Of course, there are some uncertainties. Everything to do with climate change in, into future has some uncertainties. So that means all crops under threat. And, you know, for example, there are new studies to show that almost 50 to 80 percent of the area where coffee is grown will not be suitable for coffee by 2050s. You know, like that, I can go on giving example, crop apple, apple area currently where apple is grown, cannot be grown, you know, in the, in the, in the Punjab, uh, sorry, in the, in the Himalayan parts of India and Pakistan. But my biggest worry is Bangladesh, where the population density is very high. It's one of the biggest challenges for climate scientists. Because there it's not just the warming and the changes in rainfall, it's it's flooding, it's cyclone, you know, erosion of uh, river banks, storm surge, intrusion of salt water, sea level rise. There are bigger challenges in Bangladesh. I would say all over South Asia, climate change is already impacting in some way. It will continue to impact at a higher rate in the you know coming decades, both in producing food production as well as food security, access to food for the poor. Chaturvedi, would you like to add to that? Thank you, uh, Professor Levin, for inviting us here. 
uh, yes, I completely agree with what Professor Ravindranath has said. I also wanted to touch upon some more uh, sort of macroeconomic implications. Uh, the the first thing is we should be, I mean, climate change is impacting agriculture. It's kind of very clear. IPCC has said. Professor Ravindranath has already, you know, kind of summarized the IPCC learning from that. Uh, we we need to differentiate between slow onset events versus extreme events. That's the first thing. Now, slow onset will mean that productivity is declining, you know, in the long term, and clearly it has it it will have like a 30% decline as Professor Ravanatha said, that kind of impact. The second is about extreme events. Uh, that's the Bangla Bangladesh example that Professor Ravanath gave. Increasing floods, increasing cyclones, increasing droughts. So the increasing frequency of extreme events and how these two would play out would probably be very different. Uh, and I am more worried about the increasing frequency of extreme events than the slow onset events. So to speak, of course, slow onset are also very important, but for many reasons where the productivity is already very low, we are not going to visibly see the impact of slow onset events because the productivity will keep on increasing uh, at a slower pace than what would, ha would have been on the, in the counterfactual, you know, just because the current productivity levels in many South Asian nations is anyway so low. So the potential for growth is so high, it will keep on increasing, you know. Uh, even though we are not going to reach our otherwise potential. But it's the extreme events that are kind of more scary. Uh, and we also, uh, I, I mean, in the sense, historically, we have already seen, uh, I think around 2007, eight uh, onwards uh, that year, there were the food prices started rising. And I think around 2014, 15 is when was the sort of, sort of the worst case scenario, which panned out. So we have historically, we have already seen this happening. Uh, at the height of this, uh, I think around 20 countries, ex uh, you know, banned exports of agriculture commodities. Uh, so, which is a clear manifestation of what it ended up, you know, creating. Uh, and there was a lot of social unrest. We heard about, you know, food crisis induced riots, you know, a lot of conflicts, migration. So this was just a script out of, you know, a climate change impact, which otherwise would have been, you know, highlighted as something very pessimistic kind of outlook those kind of scripts. Now, that was a script that played out uh, just very few years back. Uh, and uh, the question is, will it continue to play like this, you know, in the future also? And if extreme events, the frequency starts increasing, it would. Uh, and we at, at CW, we uh, played a very interesting game in around 2016. Uh, we, we did probably India's first uh, high-level climate risk assessment, uh, which was in collaboration with Howard, Chinghua, and the UK FCO. Uh, and there's a way I really remember it because it was a very interesting game that we played and because it, it was a multi-year kind of exercise but in India what we did we had like four different tables uh, and it, on one table there were only scientists so it was kind of a role play exercise so it was scientists uh, uh, and then they on one table there were only army journals so we actually had people from Bangladesh retired army journals from Bangladesh from US from India you know those people and then in one, there were bureaucrats and all, something like that. Uh, and then other civil society, you know, uh, actors and all. So how it play out. And, and then there was a roll of dice. So the roll of dice simply represented a random event, which is what climate is going to be like. You know, it is going to be a random event. And uh, based on the roll of dice, we, we the, the outcome was kind of shaped. And then everybody responded to it. So what was very interesting that even though it was a very bad world for all of the tables, the scientists managed to solve the problems in like the first or second iteration. Like we were all very collaborative. We ended up, you know, solving the problem. It played out very differently on the table where army uh, journals were sitting. It actually ended up in a war, you know. So the reality is... Who, between, not between who? Uh, between different countries. Because see, it, it is the... If, if the food shocks are synchronous then it is going to be very bad. So we have to differentiate between uh, food shocks that are kind of synchronous across many countries of the world versus shocks that are like in individual countries today and the next year it is some other set of countries, the next year some other set of countries. Uh, even that is bad. But the worst scenario is when a food shock across the world happens, like in one year and then successively after two years it again happens. Now that is a very bad situation. You know, and and in that kind of situation, every country will start holding, and also probably food is going to be, uh, I mean, a war issue in that scenario. You know, mm. uh, and that is again uh, appears to be very pessimistic. But uh, history, just five years earlier, has shown us that that is a this these kind of things could become a possibility. You know, so again, as I was saying, slow onset events very important, but it is going to be extreme events driven disasters if they start occurring more frequently. 
uh, they could be much more uh, you know devastating for the world and for the you know cooperative regime that is established in the world it is also about you know inflicting that kind of uh, irreversible damage uh, to that fabric so that is one thing or uh, and to, to add i mean i have many things to say but i'll probably come in uh, in response to you know other questions but these are my kind of initial remarks uh, on the macro potential implications of you know climate shocks on agriculture and i mean for our pakistani listeners we we should emphasize that uh, you know whatever is true for north india is going to be true for pakistan as well in terms of climate change impacts or possibly in some ways even worse uh, perhaps dr chaturvedi i could follow up with a, a question for you about india's response uh, in terms of uh, reducing carbon emissions uh, in its energy mix uh what is india doing what should india do more in your view and a uh, highly controversial issue of course what is and should be the role of nuclear energy in india's uh, energy mix yes thank you professor levin uh, so Indi- india is doing actually a lot and in fact many uh, reports that talk about the fair share of uh, what each country needs to do uh, in terms of their historical impacts their capabilities uh, well india is kind of up there as one of the highest performing countries uh, in terms of the renewable energy uh, the uh, the ambition is very high uh, the ambition is around 450 gigawatts of renewable energy by 2030 we are already seeing a lot of progress very fast progress especially in solar uh, because india has got a lot of potential so a lot of progress is happening already uh, in the in the solar uh, you know part of the electricity system second big thing india is doing is energy efficiency improvements so clearly there are policies which are kind of in, in in indian setup and also globally these are very famous related to led technology and lighting uh, and these are not just you know the progress in india is actually not just because of the market forces it is very visible that policy makers have decisively that their actions have decisively changed the course that is very clear so whatever success story you pick there is a very very clear kind of policy angle that these are the three things that the government did after which the narrative started changing for that particular success story so it is renewable clearly in a big way uh, and then it is uh, energy efficiency uh, especially in the building sector that is another uh, kind of uh, great development third thing that is happening currently that big transition happening underway is about electric vehicle transition in the passenger segment uh, so those three things are clearly where a lot of progress has happened a bulk of it is being driven by renewable energy and electricity sector which is also you know reflected in india's international commitment the ndc commitment in, w- in which one of the ndc focuses on the electricity generation sector and the share of non fossil energy so it's clearly reflected there also yeah so all of these are kind of great strides but also for the future uh, i think there are some other elements that are emerging one is hydrogen that is clearly emerging uh, as it because hard to abate sectors uh, like iron and steel uh, and these sectors will probably need uh some very important role of hydrogen so that is evolving and india is now announcing on the verge of announcing a hydrogen mission it was uh, it was also reflected in the budget speech of the finance minister uh, this year so now these are very clear indicators of the importance that the country is giving to the, these new emerging technologies right so hydrogen uh, kind of becomes very important a uh, nuclear energy has always been very important in india's you know debate it is just that the, the prices have been so high Uh, so it and uh, it has never uh, you know achieved the ambition but if you just talk about the ambition the government of india documents and the establishment the ambition on nuclear energy is also very high uh, it is just that traditionally india has been focusing a lot on developing its own indigenous technology on nuclear energy uh, and because we have got a lot of thorium reserves uh, and that's a very important driver to become self sufficient in energy Uh, so if india is successful in this indigenous technology then it will be like a you know it will be a phenomenal uh, story forward uh, it is just that because probably india is the only one uh, working on thorium based reactor in a big way in the world uh, it's not that you know there will be many learnings cross learning happening across countries because different countries are working on the other technology which generally speaking with light light water technology india is working on more on a different technology So that's why just because india is probably the only country working on it the progress on that technology has not been great but we are making progress slowly that's very clear and as as if the technology in fact in the last year or so there have been some very good progress uh, and some reactors have also been 
you know online and we know progress is happening if those kind of things continue to deliver then we do see a very important clearly very important role of nuclear energy finally on nuclear energy there is also this debate on you know this uh, liability because that's a very important part of nuclear energy right uh, and what we have argued in one of our papers very very recently is that there are two kinds of liabilities one can think about one is nuclear liability the trade off is with climate liability because climate change impacts are also going to be a liability and nuclear energy is a zero carbon source and also it is uh, it is not really variable like solar or wind so it could provide very important base load feature there now in the in the mix so it it could play a very important role uh, it is uh, just that is liabilities climate liability versus nuclear liability there is going to be a trade off and countries need to kind of you know find some sort of optimal mix uh, but within the net zero debate or the deep decarbonization debate nuclear energy for india is expected to play a an important role it might not be 50% of india's energy mix our results kind of show it is around to going to be 15% of electricity generation but 15% is huge uh, you know 15% of nuclear energy is huge but yes it is going to be it is a controversial but uh, in india there is actually not a lot of controversy around it the controversy is largely in europe on nuclear mm. energy india indian is like it is just an economic argument because of which it is not been able to proceed rather than the philosophical disagreement on the technology itself that's where i would like dr ravindranath would would you like to say something on um, on the ideal energy mix for india uh, i know that you've done a, a great deal of work on biomass energy for example yeah you know i just want to say one or two points nuclear energy whatever one may say it's one of the most expensive form of energy as of today if you go to all the safety costs you know all the other uh, ancillary costs nuclear energy is one of the very expensive ones so i don't know to what extent it can be uh, electricity needs i'm sure india all said and done uh, india is making a lot of progress on renewables but still coal will remain new core plants being planned inaugurated built so i'm sure india will continue to depend on coal in a significant way but it may have a, it has a big target on renewables but i think the challenge would remain uh, you know when is uh, announcement and intention and what happens on the ground on bioenergy you know there was a big hope i wrote a book in 1995 published by oxford press and it it looked like you know there were a lot of research work on biomass gasification combustion gasification and so on and also on uh, ethanol from sugarcane waste and so on and so forth but everything came to a knot and as of now the only two things in you know in the market are solar energy and to some extent wind so bioenergy has almost disappeared from you know the equation uh, I, i know in in europe in some countries bioenergy is still important wood based energy for combined heat and power as well as power generation but in india given the limited land availability limited biomass uh, availability i think it will be a challenge to pin any hopes on bioenergy or even bex by energy carbon capture and storage which ipcc and many other agencies think is critical to achieve the paris goal but bex is still you know still in in, in the development stage we don't know when by energy carbon capture storage would become a reality on a large commercial scale thank you and could i follow up um with a question about water specifically about water what do you see as the likely impact of climate change on what are already in many areas uh, water stressed regions uh, of india um and could you say something about a, a widely raised issue the melting of the himalayan glaciers how fast do you see this as proceeding and what the dangers of this are yeah firstly you know in india even without climate change there is a water crisis not there's not a single town other than the ones near the rivers all towns for example experience water crisis even in big cities like bangalore chennai hyderabad we get you know only 2 to 3 days in a week water supply in a big cities so in towns villages it's still a, even a bigger challenge so water crisis already exists even for drinking for irrigation you know where most of the water is used unfortunately the water is efficiency as we say food produced per unit of water is very low we need water is wasted so there is a big challenge currently even with our climate change but with climate change according to all the model projections done by my institute and all the global analysis shows that rainfall would increase number one number two high intensity rainfall would events would increase that means there'll be more flooding and more water flow into all the uh, you know rivers and river basins and and uh, all the 
even the hydroelectric projects there'll be more water available on the one hand there'll be increased rainfall barring there are a few pockets where drought would increase but in bulk of india in i would say 80 percent districts in india or in south asia rainfall would increase that's very bad news in bangladesh very bad news in large part of india you know more rain is always more damaging than less rain because it can damage crops damage property it can destroy you know fisheries cattle homes everything infrastructure and all that so biggest challenge for india would be there'll be more rainfall how to really harvest store utilize water availability you know demand for water is increasing there's already a water crisis in the whole of south asia uh, in some parts there may be excess you know small parts but with increase in rainfall there'll be increased flooding more stream flow uh, and maybe associated damages but the challenge would be water will be available more water due to all the models show two three fourth of the models show there'll be increase in rainfall but the challenge would be are we ready to re harvest this water store the water and use it whether for agriculture or for power generation or for meeting urban uh, rural uh, demand coming to the glaciers of course there are a lot of studies globally and even in the, the indian himalayas or hindu kush all the studies show in the last 30 to 50 years glaciers are retreating there's a decline in you know glaciers and increase in water flow and uh, so on and so forth with climate change all models show that there'll be increase in warming plus many other challenges like diesel dust and so on other aerosols depositing on on uh, the himalayan ice there'll be increased uh, melting of uh, glaciers and uh, the problem would be there'll be initially there could be surplus water but in the long term there could be a crisis for almost 500 million people indus river ganges brahmaputra all major rivers on which maybe 500 million people depend will be there is a crisis have looming you know there could be even conflict between india and pakistan on sharing indus water conflict between india and bangladesh and china on brahmaputra so there are big challenges increase in rainfall associated with increased warming is a bad combination for indian agriculture politics and security not only india but the whole of south asia mm -hmm. yeah uh, dr chaturvedi i wonder if you could say something about the what you see as the lessons of the COVID pandemic uh, for the future of climate change and action against climate change. Uh, does the response to, to COVID have important lessons for us uh, for a future of, of climate change crisis? Yes, uh, I mean, there, there are important lessons, but all I, I always think that, I mean, first of all, I hope it never gets repeated in whichever form, induced by climate or wherever because the systems will probably i mean they, they will always be stretched you know even if you it's not just about you know developing world where of course because of you know lower incomes lower resources uh, a lower degree of infrastructure uh, the response become much more challenging but even in the developed world you, you saw the you know the a pandemic is so much more challenging and so much more devastating right so uh, yes, clearly there are learnings and the learnings are not just from the pandemic. See, India has done a phenomenal job uh, in terms of its disaster resi resilience approach and response. Uh, and in our, on our East Coast, uh, a, a couple of states were kind of battered by cyclones every other year. And if you just look at data like 20 years back, the, the infrastructure devastation, as well as the lives and livelihood that those were hit 20 years back were phenomenal like a really bad situation was there but even given the resource constraint just by the virtue of better planning uh, if you now see the impact every year the cyclones i mean every other year the cyclones and, and those kind of things happen but the response is now much more streamlined uh, and the devastation it it kind of caused on our east coast is now much more manageable of course there is devastation but the response is so much more better now so clearly, uh, there is a, a planning has helped tremendously. There's no doubt about it. Uh, the pandemic induced planning will also help us tremendously just because we are much better in terms of preparedness and that learning has happened in the sort of a real life setting, right? Yes. Uh, it, yeah. So the question always is about uh, are, have we or how do we manage to formalize the structures? And that is very, very important. So what has happened on our East Coast in terms of disaster preparedness, the, the structures are not completely formalized. 
you know so it it's kind of an automatic way of functioning it happens because people know that it happens every third year you know now in terms of the climate impacts the question always will be you know which part of india you know what kind of climate disaster and what is the intensity of it you know but broadly speaking uh, pandemic does give us a lot of learning uh, and yes we we i am very sure you are going to be much better prepared it is just that if there is a food crisis then probably uh, you know the pi- pandemic does give us uh, some experience but a lot of that experience is on the health sector the, on the front of the health sector right but things like if, what do you do with a food crisis how do you manage those kind of climate shocks uh, you know floods and droughts um, yeah there will be some learnings from pandemic but i i wouldn't say that we have to that it's going to be limited to whatever we have learned during the pandemic i think learning has occ- occurred across years because as any country would face we have continued to face these climate events disasters so all this learning is kind of building up in having a better infrastructure and better human resources prepared on the ground to take on these kind of challenges thank you uh, dr ravindranath what uh, do, do you see things the same way in terms of the the impact and lessons of covid yeah you know one of the lessons i would say biggest lesson is that covid is a global uh, health challenge climate change also is a global challenge environmental challenge so i have a feeling that you know that the way the world is trying to some extent work in a coordinated way uh, and the whole the whole world is responding to covid uh, pandemic hopefully that will help us to really work better in the coming decades to address climate change because you know you can have as i say there is there is a vaccine for covid but there is there is no vaccine for climate change that means the challenge of addressing climate change will be whatever you know million times more complex and it's more widespread than covid covid also has spread in many countries but climate change is going to impact you know literally hundreds of millions of people or billions of people in sub saharan africa saharan africa south asia you know we name it even in russia every, europe everywhere so no country is free from climate challenges flooding in europe and you know forest fires in california drought in australia california so there are challenge it's such a global scale challenge i think covid has given us some little inkling of you know how world could respond i won't say world has done very well you know in a coordinated way in responding to covid i hope world will learn uh, that we need to work together in a coordinated way in a shared way uh, to address global challenges definitely climate change is a far bigger challenge there will be no single vaccine for this yeah and i just wanted to add on to uh, what professor avinash has said uh, that along with this coordination coordinated nature of responses something that is going to be critically important is how uh, uh, what is the analytical underpinning you know in the sense for example for climate we are in the process of preparing a climate risk atlas for india uh, and those kind of things what i am I, i mean that it's not just going to be about increasing events ultimately it's going to be about Uh, what is vulnerable like what investments are vulnerable what physical infrastructure is vulnerable and where are the people vulnerable you know something like that so and, and that's why these kind of uh, analytical approaches or climate risk atlases across the world are required so, so that we are much better prepared you know we know events will happen you know we just don't know when exactly but we know they are increasing going to be increasingly happening so we are able to better prepared because uh, through hotspot mapping something like that you know like we have been highlighting that these hotspot these are the districts that are vulnerable hot or hotspots in terms of floods these are the one which are vulnerable in terms of droughts you know so those kind of things so that we just uh, you know it just suddenly doesn't hit us we are much be- better prepared on the basis of analysis and then whenever it happens well it will happen but we'll we'll be in a much better situation to deal with it uh, yeah plus in on agriculture because agriculture is very vulnerable things like uh, maybe natural farming so we are doing a lot of work on natural farming in india with cw also focuses a lot on food systems but is there a way to reduce the vulnerability of our food systems you know what do we need to do because we, we know events are going to happen but how do we reduce vulnerability uh, and how do we proactively move in that direction rather than just waiting for an event to happen and us responding to that you know so on those things this sort of uh, you know analytical approaches are going to play a critical role uh, for india and for the world Uh, Dr. Ravindranath, you've spoken of the impact of climate change on food productivity. Can, can you tell us more about what India can do to to build resilience in that area? 
um, and change its agricultural practices. Uh, and what realistically are, are the chances of India being able to do that uh, rapidly, given the nature of Indian agriculture? Yeah, no, fortunately, agriculture sector, particularly the field crops, which are, you know, wheat, rice, maize and so on, they, the research is happening in India and around the world on, you know, uh, the three threats. One is increased warming, increased pest diseases, and uh, could be uh, minus stress in some regions and excess water in some regions. So the research is happening to develop uh, plant breeding and uh, genetic research is happening in India and around the world. How to develop, you know, temperature resistant, temperature tolerant, pest tolerant, even flood water tolerant and uh, drought tolerant crop varieties. And so definitely I'm sure we will have, I don't think, you know, there would be any famines and so on, you know, in, in South Asia or in the, some parts of the world, not because of uh, lack of food production could be a challenge of distribution. But food production, I would say, a lot of R&D is happening. India and South Asia is quite good. There are international institutions in India. Indian scientists are working in other international institutes outside South Asia. So I would say, firstly, we need to do a lot of research on plant breeding to come up with temperature tolerant, pest tolerant, drought tolerant, you know, even flood tolerant varieties. That's happening, number one. Number two, water management. There'll be increased the water supply due to increase the rainfall. How to conserve water, how to harvest water, how to use it for agriculture and, uh, you know, domestic and industrial purposes. That's uh, another research that's happening. But still, you know, we know it's like a basic 101 course. We know what we need to do to conserve water, to harvest water, to utilize water. But in most part of India still, the technology has not disseminated to you know South Asia to hundreds of millions of farmers. Water conservation, plant breeding, water conservation, and good agronomic practices like mixed cropping, crop diversification, integrated farming systems. So there are many options available. I would say agriculture sector is better prepared than you know the impact of climate change and forests, wetlands, oceans, and you know coastal zones. There you know it's it's too expensive. It takes there's nothing you can do if the forests disappear in the Western Ghats or the Himalayas. You can't do anything about it. But, you know, in five years, you can develop a, uh, you know, pest tolerant uh, rice variety or, you know, uh, wheat variety or corn variety. So I am I'm hopeful that agriculture scientists with support from government and even corporates and so on will, accept, will raise to the challenge, come up with technologies to meet the challenge of climate change, unlike in other natural ecosystems. But unfortunately, even the degradation of forests, wetlands and, you know, river systems, oceans also will affect uh, food security. You know, all studies show that fish availability is declining in many parts of the world and uh, fish resources are already overexploited even without climate change. And with climate change, in fact, certain fish catch will, certain species, certain varieties will disappear you know, from the regions where people are traditionally fishing. So it's not just agriculture, it includes fisheries and uh, other plantation crops, uh, which on which are tens of billion, millions of people depend. So I think uh, research, dissemination, technology transfer, maybe things like crop insurance. I think there are many strategies which are within the realm, within the possibility of governments are available for agriculture sector, unlike for many other sectors. So I am confident that there won't be any mass, uh, you know, starvation or famine or maybe migration, at least because of food production. Could I follow up for, for both of you? Uh, I mean, how much regional cooperation is happening in the area of climate change, given, of course, that especially the deep tensions between India and Pakistan? And is there any possibility of using climate change as a basis for improving regional relations in in South Asia. Um, as, as we know, unfortunately, compared to other regions of the world, South Asia has one of the, the lowest levels of regional cooperation, regional trade. So is climate change leading to, to any degree of greater cooperation or contact there? And Dr. Ravindranath, or, or not? Uh, yeah, I'll be, you know, we definitely need, there is what's called SARC, South Asia, some association for regional cooperation, but somehow it is a non-starter because of other political reasons. And uh, again, you know, there are conflicts which may increase. You know, Indus 
uh, water sharing between india and pakistan is already in the world bank uh, you know court whatever the challenges there again there are problems between india and bangladesh with respect to brahmaputra uh, also india and china so i have a feeling unfortunately that climate change will only enhance the disputes and the conflict and reduce the security then you know unfortunately instead of we should come together uh, to work together and in the uh, indus valley or uh, ganges or brahmaputra river basins how to how to optimally use the water resources which in the one hand in some place may be too much and too damaging in some place may be reduced water availability but unfortunately if you go by the last 10 20 years i don't think climate change could be a positive driver but let us hope that you know in in a worst crisis people come together governments come together you know they forget politics and try to save the uh, people you know uh, but that's only a hope i would say chaturvedi yeah i mean i mean i do uh, agree with professor ravindranath's uh, sort of pessimism on this issue because see climate is going to be one element in the larger geopolitics uh this this big issue of uh, you know river sharing that conflict between say india and pakistan uh, which is much more muted compared to the conflict between india and china and then bangladesh on Brahm- brahmaputra you know sharing now now this is just an example uh, traditionally whoever have been your kind of allies in the neighbor uh, you know they will continue to be your allies And, and and countries wherever these sort of uh, you know big discords have continued to happen they will continue Uh, so uh, even in the south asian region if let's say india has got very good relationship with bhutan and bangladesh uh, and also nepal at least historically we have even things like you know planning for electricity grids that are shared across the region right so those things are there uh, they are uh, yeah, in in the sense that in process they are they are there and there is a positive narrative around these things right why because traditionally they they have been like you know uh, friends so to speak you know many of these countries traditionally uh but some countries where these relationships are not so positive they will continue to be this way you know so yes uh, climate is going to be one element in the larger geopolitics and as far as the big natural resources like rivers are concerned it could only make things worse uh, but as, as far as mitigation is concerned uh, there is some kind of you know uh, yeah some some uh, collaborations which are happening but these are not like you know as of now these are not part defining so to speak you know they are there uh, with a positive narrative but yes by and large the story could evolve in a, in a negative direction thank you uh, just a, a word to um, our, our audience please do send your questions uh, write your questions into the uh, the Q&A uh, function and then when the first part of the discussion is over i will i will put them to the uh, Uh, to the, the panelists um i'd like to follow up with, uh, with a question about uh, the the impact on the political and social situation in india uh, especially in the countryside because of, of course we already see uh, a not inconsiderable political crisis and fairly major protests as a result of agricultural change uh, in india against the present government uh, what impact do you think uh, climate change and measures to meet to address climate change uh, will have on indian rural society and politics in future dr chaturvedi i wonder if you have any okay sure sure yeah thank you professor levin um yeah so so let me also take a step back now because we're talking about a lot about climate change impact on agriculture but uh i just wanted to highlight here in in terms of some very interesting changes happening in the agriculture sector already uh and if you would be kind of anybody who is keeping a track of news or, or in india specific news in the agriculture sector there are already some uh, you know big reforms that the government has attempted to undertake and there is a massive opposition at least in some states it appears to be in some states but it could be very well across india uh, but it, it does appear to be concentrated in some state uh, but the larger uh, the the direction in directional sense what is happening is traditionally the india's economy 
has been largely driven by forces that are that have sort of been you know left of the center so traditionally that has been the economic paradigm so if you have a, you know a private investor uh, generally you know they are evil you know sort of the thing that you generally hear in societies that are more socialist societies you know that capitalism is evil and we should not be thinking about those you know largely centrally planned development and within that of course there will be private investors and all which is fine but they are not your economy is not sort of a capitalistic economy right now that has what traditionally india has been and, and the agricultural sector also has been driven by and large through that model and now what has started happening with this government just in the last year and a half is that there is a there's clearly a move i mean what what are the drivers of the move we are not so sure about but the move has been clearly uh, to get more sort of private sector involved in terms of the uh, management of agricultural sector you know uh, that open markets you know uh, now so those that directional change is very very visible now how that directional change will pan out is for everybody to see you know because there are two alternative narratives the one narrative is that again that evil private sector narrative that they will completely take over the lands of all these poor farmers they will be devastated and they will be completely like mayhem and inequity as the end of this this move right the alternative uh, narrative to this is well this is the way it should have been governed the private sector will bring money and many of these people uh, it will lead lead to a larger growth in the economy and many of these people who were traditionally dependent on Uh, in on the local ecosystems for either loans or whatever which are anyways be very exploitative till now so it has not been a very positive story uh, so to speak right so anything that is very exploitative it's only going to get better in this new system right so now these these are two alternative narratives uh, based on whatever big shift structural shifts that we has already seen you know in the indian agricultural sector Uh, and any we have to see or view any kind of impacts of climate change how they're going to play out within that larger you know uh, shift structural shift that is already happening right so so that's what i just want it's an important point to be made uh, and that's why i want to just highlight this uh, and w- how future evolves will sort of an interaction of uh, you know both of these uh, you know uh, and uh, yes so that's where i will kind of uh, leave this point Dr. Ravindranath, how do you see uh, the situation in the Indian countryside developing uh, in in the context of climate change? You know, the the crisis will only worsen because of uh, in some regions there will be increased drought, increased water scarcity. In some other regions, too much rain, high intensity rainfall events leading to flood and damage. So I think there will be uh, surely there will be a there will be challenges. Uh, with respect to you know water you know would would be a major crisis water will be at the heart of proud say you know the challenges and crisis in rural areas between you know communities between states and the already inter- there are there are literally hundred, i don't know dozens of uh, cases in supreme court uh, where two states and multiple states are at uh, are at conflict conflict over, over sharing water resources so in the coming decades i'm sure with water crisis in some regions there is surplus water or more flood water leading to damages i'm sure there'll be a greater crisis uh, but socially politically and economically unless it's all managed well. we know for sure all models show there will increase in rainfall increase in rainfall intensity can we really sustainably conserve and use it for agriculture for you know domestic purpose for industrial use i think we we really have to focus on water and agriculture how we can use the water to promote sustain agriculture because population is growing incomes are growing demand for food and milk and fish everything is growing so we really have to if you don't meet the challenge you can't go on importing india cannot import maybe import a million or two tons from the global market the price will shoot up so india cannot import large scale food grains like some other countries can because of its uh, scale and size india will have to produce food fish milk everything you know domestically so if climate change threatens that to some extent it can even without climate change there is a crisis climate change will only exacerbate this crisis so governments and communities and you know international agencies all of them will have to work in a way to 
reduce all this you know tensions and challenges thank you thank you both so much uh, well we now have uh, some questions from the audience coming in uh, the first one is um, and whoever wants to answer first um, could the speakers touch upon food waste in South Asia um, and how this worsens food security in the region yeah you know recently uh, IPCC brought out a report uh, in uh, 2019 it's about special report on climate change and land and one of the easy you know low-hanging fruit to address climate change everyone said is to reduce food waste you know food waste even in western europe is almost like 30 to 40 percent because of it's a post harvest here you know people pick up to you know if you get one you get another one free you, get, you buy two you get three people waste you know, without using a package but in uh, india and other developing countries you know the waste at the farm on the farm and during transportation, during storage, is 30 to 40 percent. No, I agree. If you ask me, the low-hanging fruit for the world is actually minimizing the food waste, both uh, on-farm transportation, storage, and of course, post uh, you know purchase by the consumers. It's a it's a win-win for farmers. It's a win-win for government. It win for the global climate and global environment. You know, imagine if you have to produce that much less food less you know meat you need less water less fertilizer so there it's a really a super win-win low hanging best opportunities to uh, reduce food waste uh, reduce waste of water i would say uh, is a another should be the priority program for uh, south asia and for the world yes uh, yes yes you, you agree yeah, so I completely agree. I just wanted to highlight that the form of intervention would be very different as Professor Ravindath has already highlighted something very important. Then the developed world, this 40% waste comes from the plate. You know, so it's that is a waste at that point in the value chain, right? In countries or many develop, developing economies like India, it is during transit or, or it is at the farm. So it is more of a supply chain issue. It's not a consumer behavior issue. That is what we need to be differentiating very clearly. So in the developed world, it is consumer behavior issue. Whereas in developing world, it is a supply chain management issue, right? So the interventions are going to be uh, very, very different. For the developed world, it has to be more conscious consumers, you know, uh, so which is more information campaigns that don't waste food, something like that. Whereas in a country like India, it has to be much better structural change in terms of how do you manage the whole supply chain, which is a very complicated affair. You know, the, like the the way the farms are spread and how where, how do you collect, store, you need investment in cold storage. So it's a lot of investment story, you know, that uh, you have to create so many cold chains so that your food or food grains don't rot, uh, you know, as, as they do currently. So those kinds, so it's a very different story in terms of intervention uh, 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 between developed world and developing world. Could I perhaps follow up myself with a question to Dr. Ravindranath? Uh, does the, the Green Revolution provide any precedents or lessons uh, for what India and South Asia needs to do in the field of agricultural reform and change? Well, you know, Green Revolution happened at the time when there was a shortage of food in India. There used to be droughts and, you know, uh, some sort of a food security was a major crisis at the time. So at that time, the idea was to go in for dwarf varieties, short duration varieties high input agriculture, uh, high irrigation, you know, grow more food. That was like a big challenge at the time. But now I think we need to step back and, you know, there are a lot of lessons learned. There is uh, more fertilizer use. Fertilizer is used less efficiently. Wastage of water, water is efficiency is very low. And uh, we need to go for different varieties, you know, uh, high yielding varieties that are highly vulnerable to pests and diseases so now we may have to go back to traditional varieties which are much more tolerant so i would say there is a complete new paradigm shift is required the green revolution was right you know in the 60s and early 70s when food was a available food production was a crisis but now india produces enough food i think south asia can be self-reliant self-reliant is self-reliant to a large extent but the challenge is how to sustain food production in the context of climate change, you know, increased pests, increased warming, you know, increased water crisis in many regions. So we may have to really change the, you know, technology package in the food sector or food production sector, you know, go for uh, short, short duration varieties, but 
drought tolerant temperature tolerant in some regions and flood tolerant in some other regions and go for increase you know fertilizer one of the very high energy intensive product also it's a lot of emission of greenhouse gases so can we afford to waste fertilizer which is subsidized by government at a huge cost so we really have to increase the fertilizer efficiency again water is such a such a valuable commodity it's you what is efficiency in india is extremely low i think the focus should be on increasing the water efficiency increasing the fertilizer efficiency and you know optimal cropping patterns you know very often in india or in many other regions sugarcane is grown which should not be grown sugarcane consumes a lot of water instead of growing one acre of one hectare of sugarcane you can grow five hectares of maize maybe even five hectares of millets so maybe 10 hectares of millets so there is a need for major shifts in you know even the cropping pattern i would say changes in cropping pattern you know depending on crop suitable to the region water availability and so on fertilizer efficiency improvement water efficiency improvement will be very critical thank you so much uh, we have a question from kitarat orange uh, thank you for this informative panel and he asks what forms of civil society grassroots initiatives uh, especially by rural agrarian communities uh, have emerged in response to the impacts of climate change in south asia um and what do you think would be desirable in that regard um dr chaturvedi did you want to answer that first sure sure I, i'm not really an expert in kind of this particular subject about you know the grassroots grassroots initiatives what i do know for sure that uh, i mean uh, it has not been uh, the, the initiatives have been there but these are not just sort of driven uh, by uh, you know only the grassroots Uh, people but there are there's sort of a collaboration between local ngos that's extremely important i think ngos working in the field have played a very important role very positive role in informing the communities and providing the information and what like inputs on what do we what do you need to do uh, as well as scientists uh, you know so so there have been uh, those sort of initiatives where scientists ngos and local people have sort of come together to better understand what is happening in their own local uh, areas and then try to you know uh, respond to it and many times even things like you know simple watershed management activities you know those have been very very critical because now many of ultimately we are talking about these climatic variables becoming much more what do you say uh, uh, unreliable so to speak right so any intervention where you can manage them or reduce that impact of that uncertainty becomes a very valuable intervention and those kind of things are uh, kind of already happening and those are happening at many many different places in fact you know so 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 those are very positive things that are happening uh, yeah dr ravindra yeah you know uh, in india and i know even in bangladesh for sure that lot of the you know adaptation projects implemented in a small scale all by ngos or you know civil society Uh, i know if you look at if you google you will find all the projects on resilience adaptation in agriculture are all done by ngos governments are just beginning now you know watershed programs and so on but so that me so so it is a very important role to play you know firstly in biodiversity conservation which is very critical in the long term forestry what you know water conservation and uh, sharing water conserving water i would say civil society and local self help groups are very critical you know in in water conservation and water management and biodiversity conservation and even forest management i would say they have a very critical role to play in bangladesh they say it's a ngos is the civil society which has played a very critical role in really addressing many of the you know grassroots challenges so in india there are pockets where civil society has done great work but for a scale of this country uh, we need the civil society interventions to come up with very successful pilot projects building awareness in communities bringing some sort of a you know federate federating the communities and uh, to act in a cooperative way but it's it's a very big challenge uh, for civil society to, alone to face it thank you uh, we have a question from ashraf siddiqui uh, is food security a, a challenge for individual countries or is it a, a collective challenge to countries in the region and beyond and uh, a second question um how serious a threat is the blocking of water by countries against other countries uh, in south asia 
Um, is that uh, becoming a, a, an important issue um, yet? Is it likely to become a more important issue in the future? Yeah, I will answer on food security. Well, food security challenge exists even now, even without climate change. There, there's malnutrition. People talk about food security and nutrition security. People may have a lot of rice or wheat or maize to eat, but they lack the nutrition, you know, vitamins, minerals, and so on. So the nutrition security is a very bigger challenge than food security right now. With climate change, in fact, you know, I forgot to mention, there are studies to show that with climate change, even the nutrient value of the food, food grains would decline. You know, iron, calcium, and many of the vitamins, and even protein and some crops would change with climate change. You know, that's even more damaging. Even without climate change, there's already nutrition security. People lack, they may eat, a ton of rice or maize but you know they lack all the other nutrients so you know fruits vegetables and oils which we get you know all the nutrients middle class and richer people poor people lack that with again with the, what's happened is people have moved away from traditional you know hardy crops millets which were very rich in fiber and thiamine iron calcium and so on and so forth to rice and wheat and maize so there is a shift in the even the food habits of rural communities when i was young my parents used to eat my grandparents used to eat a lot of millets a lot of pulses grown locally but now my family in even in villages they eat rice and wheat period bulk of it so there is a shift we may have to go back to those uh, varieties which are hardier for they're also good from all the millets traditionally grown in rural areas like 50 years ago are hardy crops they're very good for climate you know the temperature tolerant drought tolerant and they are rich in nutrients so i think we really need to address uh, food security and nutrient security maybe through using climate change as a vehicle to go back to uh, traditional millets and pulses to improve the food security mm -hmm. and on water crisis well it is already there we don't know if there are uh, there are stories in the newspapers international press saying china is building a massive massive dam uh, that affects the flow of water in Brahmaputra to India and Bangladesh. And there is already a uh, big dispute in the World Bank on Indus water, uh, Indus Valley water. In fact, some extreme, you know, reaction India was to block water flow into Pakistan. You know, probably it's not a good idea. I think we really need to find a way of working uh, jointly given the crisis will become explosive in the coming decades. Dr. Chaturvedi? Yeah, no, I, I don't have anything to add to what uh, Professor Ravindnath has said on this question. I want to come into the next question on sustainable okay. agricultural systems, uh, if that is okay. Of course, I'll, I'll just I'll ask it so everyone sure. can hear. Um, the question is from Sana Abusin. Uh, has India started to establish new sustainable agricultural systems like hydroponics? Uh, how much progress has been made yet in, in that regard? Uh, I'm afraid from my own observations in, in neighboring Pakistan, there it has barely begun, alas, but what, yeah. in India? Sure, sure. Uh, so yeah, so that's a very interesting question it's because it, it, the answer will depend on how do we define sustainable agricultural systems, right? Uh, and I, I would simply say in India, and we, have we are just in process of releasing a report this week only, where we have looked at these multiple, you know, uh, types of traditional agricultural systems. Now, whether these were sustainable or not will depend on the definition, but it's very clearly that many of these are much more sustainable than, you know, high resource intensive, uh, you know, agriculture that has been practiced as of now. So, and, and there is complete lack of understanding in terms of our own like databases of uh, understanding that what have been the traditional practices that at least at the outset, they appear to be much more sustainable, you know, but there was complete lack of database. That's why we started this effort. So we have documented close to, I think, around 30 such practices in India, right, across various parameters. So some could be very, very localized and practiced in very few places as compared to some which are across states and across, you know, practice across by many, many farmers. And they, have, they would have many different criteria on which we have kind of compared, uh, you know, these very different, uh, you know, practices. Uh, so. Uh, by and large, I would say that, yes, there are many such practices. It is just that these are not mainstreamed in the debate or the narratives, right? It is traditionally farmers have been practicing many of such, many, many such, you know, activities. 
we just need to bring an our effort is in that direction you know when we are documenting it the whole idea is for us to bring it these into mainstream and and see that well are there learnings from one practice that we can kind of cross pollinate uh, and push into the larger agricultural system you know so to speak yeah but yes so th- those have been practiced we, we just need to know much more about them and probably that's that is the stage at which we are the latest sort of uh, or the biggest thing in the discussion in india at least in the natural you know agriculture uh, thing uh, is something called zbnf zero budget natural farming uh, and that is uh, that is probably one of the practices that is uh, being adopted by farmers at a much bigger scale as compared to any of the other uh, you know traditional practices right so it is zero budget natural farming practice now it also became important because i think in the budget speech of last year the finance minister also highlighted this zbnf that they are going to allocate some money for it so then it suddenly so now this is a very this is a great example of how do we mainstream you know certain such traditional practices but what also started happening is you know many in the scientific community in the agriculture scientific community are also uh, you know are are in the think uh, in the thought process which is more aligned with so what is known as your western scientific principles as opposed to traditional methods right so now there started a tussle or some sort of you know sort of pushback that these traditional practices are non scientific so to speak Mm. you know just because they don't adhere to those criteria by which the western science views these practices yeah so because of these kind of things you know there is some pushback and we are trying to understand this better but the the reality is traditionally many such practices are being followed you know uh, again this tussle how do we need how are we able to satisfy these scientists who are used to a different approach is we need to bet we need to see it how it plays out uh, yeah uh, dr avindran how do you see this this issue uh, that there is no option than sustainable agriculture uh, because population is growing demand for food is increasing can we subs- can we sustain food production food availability can we sustain water supply water availability are a big challenges of course we don't need to get bogged down in what is sustainable agriculture what is sustainable water management but government of india of course is well known it has got in name it there is a program for example there is a national mission on sustainable agriculture there is a greening india mission and there is a national watershed program and national innovation innovative climate climate resilient agriculture program india has big programs on everything in name it uh, but i think and of course very importantly agromet advisories you know fantastic agromet advisories available on on the weather forecast and weather based uh, crop map production management practices a lot of experience exists and uh, i don't want to get bogged down in definitions and giving terminology but what's most critical is how to conserve and sustain soil productivity which is very critical which is the heart of food production if soil is soil getting degraded right now in india land degradation if you ask me is the biggest challenge facing indian agriculture loss of soil fertility a loss of you know soil top soil soil erosion that are the biggest challenge how we can conserve protect and enhance soil fertility number one number two how to really maximize the water is efficiency where water whatever what is available can we use it in a sustainable efficient way i would say soil management and water management if you take care of these two probably there will be no other challenge you know fertilizer i agree fertilizer can its utilization efficiency can be increased which is also very low i would say soil management water management and efficient fertilizer use would be good enough to sustain food production in india we don't need to get bogged down with all this co2 emissions and so on from agriculture because agriculture is sector where there are 120 130 million farmers many of them are small poor uh, let us not burden them with any mitigation let them you know go for sustained water management sustained crop yields i would say that's very critical for them thank you uh, we have a question from medani pandari do you see any correlation uh, as yet between the impact of climate change and uh, as we know uh, the rise of suicide by farmers in india is do, do you see that as an observable phenomenon yeah i mean you know there are many studies trying to link drought with suicide which true for sure especially 
farmers who grow very in cash in intensive crops like hybrid cotton and so on they take huge loans and if there is a drought or a pest attack if the crop fails they end up you know uh, committing suicide there are, uh, there are it, it happens in pockets in andhra pradesh in maharashtra yes there is definitely a link towards uh, you know climate linked drought and pests uh, uh, you know attacks leading to crop losses and you know on the extreme uh, measure the farmers take uh, it's true in tobacco growing areas in in in, in andhra pradesh maybe there is some link but there are, there are many other things we can do even without worrying about climate to reduce you know the stress farmers face so is this partly a consequence uh, once again of uh, moving to the wrong kind of crops crops that are particularly vulnerable to these sudden impacts uh, and away from you know the, the kind of sustainable crops that you described uh, because that would su suggest perhaps a need to to, to move away from uh, to some degree from commercial agriculture um, you know, in, in these specific vulnerable fields. What, what do you think? You no, know, cotton and tobacco are two extreme examples where, you know, there's a huge investment made by farmers per hectare. If the crop is good, they get massive profits per hectare. Like, no other, you know, you'll, you can never make money from rice, wheat and millets. They make money from tobacco and the cotton. They invest heavily. There are varieties available which are they are pesticide intensive, fertilizer intensive, and of course water intensive. You get huge profits. That's a big challenge. You know how to wean farmers away from that. But but of course we need to come up with cotton varieties, which are you know pest tolerant, drought tolerant. Maybe yield may be slightly less, but you have a stable yield. That's one way. The other challenge, which every expert agronomist, water management expert in India would tell you, is. There are many regions where sugar cane should not be grown, many regions where cotton should not be grown. And a uh, lot of water is wasted in growing sugar cane. Sugar cane uses like four to five times more water than, you know, most of the crops. So as I told, as I was mentioning, one hectare water required to produce sugar cane one hectare, you can go 10 hectares of, you know, many other millets and other like maize and uh, sorghum. So it's a big challenge. There have been debate, but it's a political issue. No minister or government wants to tell farmers no don't grow sugar cane you know instead of that we'll probably incentives to grow other crops if this debate is going on but at some stage probably there is no option than to bring certain laws or certain incentives and disincentives to make farmers not to grow some crops and to grow some crops this will happen it has to happen in the coming uh, decades for sure yeah. Dr. Chaturvedi, is, is it realistic to, to expect Indian governments to, to, take this, to take this line, given the unpopularity involved? Yeah, I mean, let, let me just come to this farmer suicide issue because it is a very saddening issue. Uh, but I don't think, uh, even what Professor Ravanath has said, that there is any link between a particular crop, or the choice of crop itself, with the suicide. Suicide is a much more complicated thing and because it is also about the finances, about the local money lenders, you know, the rates of interest that the farmers have to give, give back. And it is not at all that only big tobacco or cotton farmers uh, who, who invested a lot end up, doing, end up committing suicide. It's even the many times, many, many small and marginal farmers who don't actually have any land and who have actually invested in wheat and uh, you know, rice, they are actually also end up you know, committing suicide. So there is no, I don't think we will be able to draw any link. Uh, the broader point I'm making is, is it is a systemic issue rather and climate change or drought is one of the factors. It could be one very important factor, but as far as the Ravindad has also said that uh, even irrespective of climate change or droughts, I mean, just because drought has happened does not mean anybody has to give his or her life, you know. So it is a systemic issue rather than a climate or a, or a drought issue, which has to be tackled. And the, the the question on whether sugarcane should not be grown in those, you know, uh, uh, water scarce area, we have been saying this for so many, so long, so many scientists have been saying, it is just that the political economy of these crop choices uh, is much more complicated, you know, they, whatever we keep on saying, the reality is that farmer ends up making like, they are very rich farmers. So farmers who have invested in sugarcane are one of the richest farmers uh, in a, a particular region of India. So there is no reason un unless water actually dries down, 
completely so they will keep on you know growing sugar cane till that last drop of water is available because it is a common property resource at the end of the day they are going to derive money and they are becoming richer in the process there is nothing stopping them and uh, and it's become a very political issue the government of india and uh, that state governments have been trying but uh, to no uh, with no progress at all because there are very powerful sort of electoral lobby uh, yeah, so that's why it is not no progress has happened not that the issue has not recognized it is recognized but no progress has happened uh, in that direction um a question for dr ravindran because you're an expert in this region in, in this uh, area uh, deforestation in south asia has increased flooding and air pollution um what have what are governments in the region doing uh, to try to monitor and reduce deforestation yeah you know uh, i've written a lot about it this is one area where india has succeeded to, to a large extent uh area under deforest about 20 to 22% uh and uh, if you go by the remote sensing satellite based uh, forest monitoring it ended up first increasing uh, honestly it's uh, I, i wrote about it even 20 years ago you know recently also i wrote the forests in india are monitored much better than you know other things what more and soil and so on to, to tell you honestly and uh, forest always evokes interest in people in mass media and in parliament everywhere so thanks to forest conservation act, act of 1980 forests are reasonably well protected in india reasonably that there may be some level of uh, uh, forest degradation happening here here and there but there is no massive deforestation like in uh, indonesia or malaysia or myanmar or brazil or, or you know congo basin countries no no not at all india is one thing india succeeded is in reducing i won't say totally zero the reducing deforestation bangladesh there is so little forest and uh, there is nothing to lose there is so if anything they can only increase the area under forest so fortunately and even the carbon sink of forest increasing you know i made estimate for carbon sink for forest in india for government of india so carbon sink in forest is continuously increasing uh, again the forest survey of india also makes uh, carbon inventory in forest and carbon stock estimates so it's a wrong impression that you know deforestation is happening in india no but unfortunately it's happening in brazil in india in southeast asia in congo and many other parts of the world but uh, not in south asia because in pakistan bangladesh so little forest is anyway there nothing to lose they have they can only increase india is reasonably successful in conserving forests what they have and if anything they are adding more area under trees well that's good news anyway that's that's encouraging for a change um a question uh, for either panelist um what holistic methods can farmers implement Uh, in order to reduce erosion which is also a serious problem in certain areas well you know this is one of those 101 course we are when i was student of agriculture they taught us 10 practices how to reduce erosion how to conserve soil how to conserve moisture you know uh, one of course contour bunding and uh, contour trenches and uh, 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 there are crops that you can grow mix uh, mix crop uh crop diversification uh mulching there are you know it's a 101 textbook examples available for any first year student of agriculture but the challenge is unfortunately in india despite you know long ago when i was a student i learned all these things in the first year of my agriculture course but even today they are taught even today the governments are trying to promote this soil conservation water conservation because both are linked You know, like a watershed program aims the basic aim of watershed program which one of the largest program is to conserve soil and moisture within a watershed and enhance crop productivity sustain crop productivity many practices available some of them are very simple and also good for farmers for them for their own good you know if you conserve all the rain that falls in your plot with a with a farm pond and with a check dam and you know it's good for you and for your neighboring farmers but uh, unfortunately it's not happening i don't know why farmers find it easier to buy fertilizer and apply it and see a little more increase in yield farmers much find it much more easier to change the variety and you know, get more yield but somehow they do much less on soil and water it's a, i don't know there is something i have not been able to understand yeah uh, a big question um what are india's efforts to combat climate change at the global level 
Um, and where do you see uh, future uh, directions of Indian policy lying when it comes to international negotiations and action on climate change? Um, would you like to sure, sure. so that? so uh, combating climate change essentially i mean one could talk about both mitigation as well as, as well as combating the impacts of climate change which is largely the adaptation story uh, so on the, on the mitigation side uh, one is domestically whatever india is doing like it's heavily investing in renewable energy uh, clearly now f- f- started focusing on uh, the battery story the electric vehicle story the hydrogen story so it's clearly making a, I mean, lot of investments and and focusing on these directions. Uh, but interestingly, uh, in in terms of the international, uh, you know, arena, uh, I think one of the most uh, interesting and important developments was the International Solar Alliance, because it is not just about India; it's all the countries in the tropics uh, and all the countries where the cost of finance is extremely high. Uh, so International Solar Alliance uh, was a was started by India and France together and, and when the Paris Agreement uh, 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 was uh, uh, during that time, the COP in Paris, uh, COP uh, in 2015. Uh, and that's where uh, it, at this particular, uh, through this particular platform, which is the latest intergovernmental platform, uh, the idea is not just to do another set of studies. The idea of ISA, because CEW was heavily involved in even conceptualizing and then pushing through ISA, the idea was not at all that there is another IRENA or N21, another United Nations organization, which just which collects information, does analysis, is not at all like that. It is completely action. So action, action is the idea behind ISA, uh, and it's simply uh, the why so because we found that in many developing economies, including India, the cost of finance was uh, unimaginably high, because the risk premiums in these economies are so high, uh, because you know these are emerging markets. Uh, so, because of the high risk premium, the cost of solar based energy or all of these renewable energy, which are non traditional sectors, they were so high. The cost was so high that these were like uncompetitive. And this is not just India's story, this is also the Africa story. So, at a, at a platform like ISA, if you are able to pool in money and if you are somehow able to, uh, you know, take over that project risk, that, that risk premium that investors need to give, if you are somehow able to take over that risk, then it becomes a much more viable proposition and the pace at at which we need these things to increase we will actually be able to deliver on it you know because otherwise also these things are increasing it's not that solar is not increasing in india or africa it is as the pace of transition that we need is much more faster the required pace and that is where these sort of things are very important so india is doing not just domestically whatever it could do but it also trying to shape that global narrative by thinking about these very innovative ideas uh, you know, and especially that's why India has been uh, instrumental in bringing the uh, low cost of finance issue at the global stage, uh, which is benefiting now Africa, India, and many other you know uh, Asian and non-Asian developing economies to push their non-traditional sectors with full you know full force, which, which is required to be done. Thank you. Uh, we have a question. Um, women play, of course, a critical role in farming in India. Um, and are even more vulnerable and marginalized um, economically and socially. Are any efforts uh, underway you know, in the specific area of action against climate change uh, specifically to support uh, women in the countryside? Uh, or can one only do this through trying to support farmers in general? Well, you know, every, uh, there are enough studies to show up in, uh, in the developing world that women are at the cutting edge. Uh, women collect water, women collect, uh, cook food, women, uh, you know, also involved in agriculture heavily. And uh, it's very critical for agriculture production, but climate change will impact them. Obviously, it will impact the whole world. It will impact women much more. But uh, there, of course, there are efforts. If you look at any, there are a large number of watershed programs. Under the watershed program, there are self-help groups are formed where, you know, they play a critical role in organizing themselves and you know in in credit and marketing and so on they work together and i would say women have a very critical role in water conservation in agriculture as well as uh, uh, you know in all the other related sectors livestock and so on but uh, i don't think there's any you know major initiative from government of india or any states in the context of climate change uh, you know to improve their women's lot but if you look at uh, all the efforts by the civil society or NGOs, they are trying to organize women 
and bring about change you know with respect to water management in agriculture with respect to forest conservation restoration of grasslands so i think women are playing a very critical role in all many of the initiatives by civil society and ngos and you know world bank and so on uh, much more than you know in any government led efforts mm. um i have a question which i think you partly answered already uh, the final question uh, what type of diet will promote sustainable agriculture in south asia um you know does the population especially the middle class population need to change its diet and go back perhaps to uh, to as a, to a traditional diet um in order to uh, to improve the resilience of agriculture you know the, the special report on climate change and land talked about two things one is i already mentioned waste which is a low hanging fruit which is a win win second is a diet again it's a win win uh it's use more, more plant based diet and you know locally grown food it's good for health everyone knows you know all those blue zones can, uh, parts of the world where centenarians live they all eat locally grown food in the one form they live longer they are centenarians but uh, here it's a uh, india of course you know though it's people get a wrong impression that india is largely vegetarian because the middle class and some upper caste they're all vegetarians like me we vegetarians even when i come to europe or africa i try to remain vegetarian but you know 90 80 to 90 percent they eat meat but unfortunately meat production uh, meat consumption is low because of the cost uh, cost of meat is very high in india so people they eat meat only during festivals or maybe and once in a week and so on in rural areas as far as i know i know quite well i stayed in villages for many years people eat meat once in a week or during festivals fortunately in india meat is not produced uh, you know in a commercial industrial scale like you know in argentina brazil or us and and europe so it's still you know poultry except the few poultry farms but a lot of the poultry in rural areas is still traditional uh, there is no uh, beef production in india anyway there is beef eating is banned sheep and goats are managed by in the po- poorest farmers in india manage sheep and goats so for them it's a source of income also a source of food and nutrition so i would say in india it's not a big problem uh, we, we we don't need any campaign to go back to plants and you know locally grown food it's happening because simply even though 80% plus are vegetarians uh, sorry the meat eaters they don't eat meat at all like uh, you know like argentinians brazilians or uh, north americans so it's not a problem at all in india people eat uh, we all eat plant based foods uh, you know six days in a week maybe one day in a week meat based maybe a little bit egg omelet and so on middle class rural poor they eat only wheat and rice and corn thank yeah. you so, so just to oh. add on to professor ravinath i mean india sponsored a resolution in the at the un for making 2023 as the international year of millets so this debate is going on this has been accepted now so that year is going to be so this debate is going on and we are just trying to better understand and we need to understand the you know historically how we move from traditional food to whatever we are eating right now uh, and that story is dominated by you know private sector coming in in a big way and kind of selling polished rice and wheat all the polished grains and now mm-hmm. we are realizing that that's not what we wanted because they they favored it because there are you need centralized food supply chains where you could easily supply you know polished food grains and all uh, these local diets are much more decentralized in nature it it needs a very different kind of uh, you know agriculture and supply system uh, but yes we are trying now our best to go in that direction re- kind of reverse the, the the clock and get to med- much healthier you know food systems and that is something very core to one of the programs that cw has started just to you know change the way india eats basically yeah mm-hmm. Well, good luck. So uh, we've come to the end of our time. So I would just like to say thank, many thanks to both of you for, for, for participating and you know, helping us to understand really this most important of all subjects and one which affects so many people, obviously in South Asia, but in the wider world. So thank you very much for a most interesting panel. And I hope that uh, we can work together in, in future on this. Uh, Ahmed, do you want to say a few sure, words? Sure, thank you. Thank you. Uh, me too. I would like to thank, first of all, the audience for joining us today in, in, in this uh, discussion. And I would like to express my gratitude to Drs. 
uh, Ravindranath, uh, Shatul Vedi, and uh, leave him for this insightful conversation on this very, very important topic. Uh, also, I would like to thank the events team and the Sears team for organizing the webinar. And I encourage everyone to visit the Sears website to learn more about the Environmental Studies Research Initiative. We, in effect, have just started, and hopefully there's the, there will be much more on, on, on this timely subject. We hope to see you and at our future lectures and events, and thank you again, and have a good day. Thank, thank you for inviting us. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Bye. Goodbye.